Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody's kids wake them up nice and early. Good job, kids. I was praying for that. Glad everybody was able to make it out here on this Christmas Sunday morning. So let me be the probably the 50th person to say Merry Christmas this morning. And when we say Merry Christmas, it's funny because today the world is trying to get you to stop saying Merry Christmas, right? They're trying to get you to stop saying it in school. They're trying to get you to stop saying it at work. You know, we don't we don't have Christmas break anymore. We got what? Holiday break, right? We we don't go to Christmas balls anymore. We go to holiday balls. And how many got how many people got a holiday tree in the house? <laughs> Nobody got. Who raised their hand? I'm gonna get a whooping. We got Christmas trees in the house, right? Anybody watch the holiday story last night? Ain't no such thing. It's a Christmas story, right? Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. When people say they want you to call it holiday season or holiday break, why is that? They want you to say that because they say, well, I don't believe in Christ. You know, I'm offended. You know, I want you to say holiday. I don't believe in Christ. You you shouldn't be spreading all this Christianity everywhere. It's the holiday season. It's not the Christmas season. Well, when people say that, the first thing I say to them, well, which holiday are you talking about? And every single time I say it, the first thing they say was, well, Christmas. Well, okay then. So what's the point? If you're going to say holiday season and the holiday that you're talking about is Christmas, then why are you worried about saying Christmas? Because I bet you they take that Christmas vacation. I bet you they take that Christmas bonus, right? (laughs) And even if they don't take that day off, I I guarantee you they're taking that Christmas double time, right, if they're working, right? They don't have a problem with it then. They're not offended with it then. I don't believe in the boogeyman, right? But if somebody's talking about them, how am I going to be offended about them if I don't believe them in the first place? It don't make any sense. So Merry Christmas. Now, a lot of us, or like Brother Hall, where's he at? Brother Hall says us is, who believe in Christ, we like to argue about Christmas Day, right, Sister Letty? We are talking about it this morning in Sunday school. We like to talk about, well, don't call it Christmas. Nobody knows the day he was born. He wasn't born on December 25th. Nobody knows it's 2,000 years ago. Stop calling Christmas December 25th. That's not when the Christ was born. If you were caught up so much, we'll spend all December arguing about the day that he was born. Some of us can't remember our own children's birthdays. You better remember your wife's birthday. But you can't remember your children's birthdays, but you want to create a a big argument all, all year about the day that Christ was born. It's not important about the day that he was born. What's important is why he was born. Sam, get me uh, Matthew 121 and John 3.16. If if you spend all of December talking about the day that Christ was born, then you have missed the mark. This morning we're here to talk about the reason for the season. You heard that before? What's important is about why Christ was born. He was born for my sins. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. Chastisement of his peace was upon him, and through his stripes I am healed. That's why he was born, Isaiah 53. Amen. Matthew 121, what's it say, Stan? It says, he shall be the first born of the time. Uh, and his name is what? And he shall be called his name shall be Jesus. Okay. For he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people from their sins. That's why... He was born. Why else was he born? John 3, 16. You probably don't even have to look at it. You probably know it. John 3, 16, Sam. John uh-huh. Keep going. Everlasting life. That's why he was born. We are here this morning to celebrate the reason and the fact that Christ was born, not to debate the day that it happened. What's important is, that it happened. So Merry Christmas. I want to welcome all the visitors here to the Lakeside Church of Christ. I like to say we're a small church, but we're a big family. Amen. Uh, got some some of my own personal visitors in the back, the Hunter family. How y'all doing? Good. Embarrass them a little bit. Merry Christmas. So my gift to y'all this morning will be, I will try to be timely. I know somebody's got something in the crock pot. Still going, Sister Spivey? 
If you do, let me know. We'll come help you out with that. But I, char- I charged up my iPad fully, so I'm not waiting on the battery to go down. I can stay up here all day if I want to. But let's get to the text. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. If you have a say, amen. Let me get a brother to start reading that for me. Mm hmm. Okay, so we got Caesar Augustus. Now, we know Caesar means important, right? Caesar's an important guy. Now, we, we, we know about some famous Caesars. Caesar Augustus was one of the most famous, but probably his predecessor, Julius Caesar, is somebody we're more familiar with. But Caesar Augustus is credited with this big thing that he created called the census. All right? A census is conducted when they count the people. They want to get an accurate count of the people. It's funny, today in this country, we try so much to get away from the Bible, but ironically, most of our laws and traditions come from the Scriptures. The fourth book in your Bible, the book of Numbers, literally means God tasked Moses with the task of counting the people. That's why it's called Numbers. Then and now, the census had political purposes. You know, don't get it twisted. They weren't counting the people just because they wanted to know how many people he had under his rule. You know, he, it wasn't like his Facebook page. He wasn't trying to brag to other Caesars, you know, I got 4,368 friends. Right, Chris? For the, then and now, the census was conducted for political reasons. And what was that reason? Keep, keep reading, Reggie. Okay, so he, he's, taking, he's taking this census. He's taking this count of people because he issued a law that he had the great idea that everybody should be taxed. Everybody know what a tax is? It means somebody steals money from your paycheck. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Got my first paycheck in the Army, and it said deduction, FICA. I was like, who is FICA? And why is he taking $400 out of my check? Taxes. It's a rude awakening. You don't make as much as you thought you did. When you make it, they just take it. So he conducts a census because when it starts time to count the money, the money needs to add up to the people, right? So if I know I got 100,000 people, then I should have probably $50,000. So you take an account. I don't know what the tax rate was back then, but it might be accurate. It was probably more than that. But he's taking account of the people so that they can get an accurate budget for the, for the taxes. Right. So then and now, the, the purpose of the census had political purposes. Today we take the, you know, for distribution of funds or alignments for, uh, for congressional representation. You know, they argue about that all the time. You've got an election coming up, you're going to hear all about these district lines. And they want to redraw the lines so a Republican can get elected over here or a Democrat can get elected over here. That was the reason for the census. Okay, let's, keep, let's continue with the text. Go ahead, Reggie. Okay, so lineage is very important in, in Jewish history, right? Matthew chapter 1, the whole chapter is about Christ's lineage. So in order to get an accurate count, Caesar Augustus ordered that everybody had to go back to where they came from. So now you have Mary and Joseph traveling back to Bethlehem, five miles south of Jerusalem. Let's keep reading. Uh huh. Brother Hall, get for me uh, John six forty eight through fifty one. So they went to Bethlehem, and it wasn't by accident that they went to Bethlehem. You know, see, God is so smart. He's so smart. He's either real smart or I'm real dumb. It's probably both. But he sent them to the town of Bethlehem. See, Caesar thought that. He thought that these taxes and the census was his idea. You know, but this was all in God's plan. Because of, because of Caesar's taxes, because of his census, and because of the law he passed, everybody had to return back to their home. 
Now, they were from Bethlehem. Anytime you see the word Beth in your Bible, that means house of. If you've got a dictionary in the front of your Bible, just turn to the Beth section, and you're going to see Bethlehem, house of bread. Bethlehem literally means house of bread. It's the city of David. Bathsheba, house of medicine. Or Bethel, the house of medicine. Bethel, house of God. Beth means house of. So they returned to Bethlehem, the city of David, the house of what? Bread. Now, that wasn't a mistake. You gotta, when you look at the scripture, you've got to look at it with a microscope. Why is it important that they went back to Bethlehem? For the whole, read John 6. Uh, 40, 48 through 51. Hold up. Is that text red? Okay, so that's Jesus talking. He said what? He is the bread of life. Now, isn't it a coincidence that the, the man who calls himself the bread of life was born in the house of, somebody's listening, house of bread. Y'all ain't getting this. Keep reading. Uh-huh. They were eating the bread in the wilderness. Now they're dead. But where, where is he from? Keep reading. It comes from where? Heaven. The bread comes from heaven. Uh huh. Keep going. That's good enough. Y'all got the point. He was born in the house of bread. He is the what? The bread of what? The bread of life. From where? From heaven. That's good enough. I think they get the point. Let's move on. So they showed up in Bethlehem. This wasn't by accident. This wasn't by coincidence. It was all part of God's plan. From, from Abraham to Joseph was 42 generations, the making of Jesus. They said that he would be born in a manger. They prophesied this. They said that he would be wrapped in swaddling cloth. They said that he would be born of a virgin. He was born from Mary, a 16-year-old girl from the ghettos, of Palestine. Now, does this sound like this was the Savior of the world, the Son of God? Does this sound like the kind of birth or the kind of lineage that the Son of God would come from? King Herod, he issued a, he issued a law. King Herod was a very vicious man. They say it was safer to be Herod's pig than his son. Why? Because he killed so many people. He killed, he, anytime anyone threatened him for his power, he was so power hungry. And at this time, he's an old man. He's old and dusty, beat up. But anytime somebody threatened him for his power, he just killed him. He didn't value human life at all. He was wretched. He killed his mother-in-law. He killed his father-in-law, his wife, his brother-in-law. Then when it, he found out that his sons might be taking his throne, he killed his own sons, two of them. He was ruthless. When he found out that the Savior had come, he, he put out an order. What was the order? He ordered that every single child, every single boy under the age of two years old should be what? Killed. That's pretty bad. You're going to kill all the... Don't, he's not even saying, go find this guy and kill him. He's saying, I'm going to kill all the babies, all the two-year-olds and below. Get rid of them. So from birth, they were trying to kill the Savior. He was born in a manger. Which verse were you on, uh, Reggie? Go ahead. You went there to the register with Mary. Mm -hmm. She was pledged to be married to him and was expecting the child. She was expecting the child. The King James Version says she was great with child. That means she was nine months pregnant. Grandma used to say she was hanging low. You remember. So Mary's about the, about the bus, right? Now they've walked, you know, they didn't drive. They, they came down back to Bethlehem and they show up to the end. Go ahead and read, Reggie. Uh huh. Uh oh. Keep going. Keep reading. Mm-hmm. 
He was born in a manger wrapped in swaddling cloth. Swaddling cloth, that means just strips of the, the cheapest Hebrew cloth that you have. The Son of God was born in a horse stable, and he was wrapped in this ripped up rags and placed for his first crib in a pig's feeding trough. Why? Because they said they didn't have room for him in the end. Sad to say, some of us don't have room for Jesus today. That's the title of the sermon this morning. Do you have room for Jesus? You see, when you woke up this morning, right, when the kids came in there jumping on your bed, telling you to get up, and you went down there to that tree, that fake one or that live one, and you looked under there and you saw all those presents, and you, you saw the kids, your kids' face light up when they opened up their brand new cell phone, right, Sierra? Y'all pray for me. I got Sierra got a cell phone now. <laughs> or when you opened up that diamond necklace or that diamond ring or that cubic zirconia. <laughs> or or you got the all those things that you got under that tree, you know, and you were happy and you were like, look what we did. You spent all year preparing for Christmas and trying to get these things and oh I gotta make these sacrifices because I really know he wants that, you know, that Xbox or that Y box or you know, the we station, or I, I got to do these things. I got to get them these things. I got to get rid of these things, and I got to sacrifice these things so I can get these things. But we spend the whole year worrying about all these things. And when we get these things and we see how happy it makes our families and our loved ones or ourselves, we start to, we forget that it wasn't you that got those things. You start to think that it's because of the things that you did that got you those things. Sometimes you go overboard, right? What's, what's the highest suicide rate and divorce rate of the year? Right around Christmas and New Year's. Because everybody spent all this time trying to get these things. And they maxed out their credit cards. Their bank account's empty now because they were trying to focus on getting all these things that they think that would make them happy and make their lives easier. And then they start having buyer's remorse a couple, couple of weeks, maybe a couple of days later, because they realized they went overboard and they didn't have that money to spend. Now what about all these other things, like these light bills, or these car payments, or these house payments, all these other things? The Bible, my Bible says, if you seek first the kingdom of God, then all these things will be added unto you. So you're spending the whole year focusing on the wrong things. If you're seeking first the kingdom of God, of God, you won't have to worry about all those things. Merry Christmas. All right. I'm, every time I get quiet, I'm going to say that because then y'all laugh. Where are we at? When they showed up to the uh, hotel room, there was a no vacancy sign. Now, the Bible says that Mary was ready to deliver. You got to remember, they've been traveling all night. It's December. It's cold outside. They've been getting here. They didn't plan on coming here. Now, they were expecting to be able to have a room. Joseph is standing at the desk. He's pulling out his visa. He's like, I need a room with king-size bed. And the guy says, brother, we don't have any room for you here. There's no vacancies. If he would have known that Mary was carrying Jesus, and he could say, stay here, the Savior in, where the Savior of the world was born. You think he would have made room for Jesus that night? If the proprietor would have known that, you know, Mary's coming and she's got the Savior of the world in him, you think they would have made room? They would have started kicking people out. He would have gave them his room. No, come on in. We can get you the best. They didn't have Egyptian cotton back then. Well, maybe they did. It was the Middle East. Probably had Egyptian cotton, right? They would, have put, they would have laid out everything for him. This is the king, the prince of peace. We've got to get ready for him. But that wasn't the case. They didn't know Jesus was coming. That's a sermon right there. They weren't ready for him. Right? Had they known he was coming, they would have got ready. 
But Mary's standing there. She's having contractions. She's beating Joseph in the arm. You better do something, boy. This baby's coming. You know how it is. Right, Brother Hall? He's got about ten of them. <laughs> you know how it is? Mary's like, boy, get a room. So what's the first thing they could find? The best thing that they could find was a manger. Now, see, the problem, the problem that we have is that we want to think of manger. Anybody here ever been in a manger? No. Anybody here ever seen a, a real manger? The, the picture that we have of a manger is when you drive by somebody's front yard or outside one of these churches and you see, you know, the palm trees and, and, and they got Jesus lying in this little, you know, wooden looking crib thing. And, you know, they got people kneeling and praying and, you know, three little donkeys on the side and probably some stars. This beautiful little peaceful scene. Now, I, I used to be a labor and delivery nurse. I've seen lots of babies born. And I can tell you, no matter how experienced the mom is or how nice the room is, there is nothing peaceful about childbirth. <laughs> now, there's nothing peaceful. It's not beautiful. I don't care what they say. It ain't beautiful. It's nasty. <laughs> That's why I used to be a labor and delivery nurse. But... That's, that's today. That's down at Memorial or wherever, you know, in the $1,000 room. We back in the first century. Mary's been walking all day. She's having contractions. There ain't no room in the hotel. The visa wasn't where he wanted it to be that day. So the best place that he could find for his wife to give birth to the Son of God was in a manger. Now, a manger back in the first century was nothing more than a, a couple of rocks piled around the outside of a little cave, a hollowed out hill. That kind of tells you a little bit about his death, doesn't it? Jesus was born right outside of a little cave. He was buried right inside a, a little cave. We'll get, I'll skip that one. This manger was nasty, okay? It's December probably. It's wintertime at least. It's freezing cold. They've been outside. They don't got a room. They're in this nasty manger. There's probably horses in there. There's probably pigs in there. It ain't clean. Had they known he was coming, they would have hosed it out. They would have swept it out, brushed it out, poured some peroxide in the trough, got it ready. But they didn't know he was coming. And Mary, the baby ain't waiting. He's been waiting for nine months. This is a real baby. God wasn't just half man, half God. He was all man and all God. So he's coming out just like every single one of us in here came out. And he's coming out when he's ready. And he's ready. So they didn't have time to clean it up. The Son of God was born in a dirty, nasty, smelling like manure manger. Why? Because they didn't have room for him in the end. Now, when I think about that, when it used to, I used to wonder, why in the world would God let that happen? Why would he let the Son of Man, the Savior, the Messiah, be born in a dirty, nasty pig's feeding trough? And then it occurred to me, after studying for a while, he let him be born in that dirty, nasty place because he knew that one day he would want to live in your heart. Y'all missing it. You see, if he would have been born in the NICU or in the STICU or ICU, in the neonatal special care unit, he might not have felt comfortable living in your heart. That manger, that feeding trough, that nasty, dirty place, not worthy of the Son of God, is allegorious of your heart. Y'all missing this. Your heart is not good enough for Jesus, your heart is dirty, nasty, not worthy. He's born in this dirty manger because he's going to take up residence in your heart. God had to prepare him for where he was going to go. Let me give you the scripture because y'all, y'all just, hold on. But uh, somebody get John 15, 4. 
6, 7, 9, and 10. Y'all don't believe what I'm saying. Yeah, John chapter... Uh, what does it say? Abide? abide in me. He said abide. What does abide mean? That's a hospitality term, right? That means in something. He said do what? Abide in me. Abide in me. And I in you. And who? And I in you. I in you. Jesus wants to abide in you. God said he was going to do that. He's preparing them to do that. He put them in this nasty manger because your heart is just as nasty. It's just as dirty. It's just as unworthy. Keep reading. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, uh-huh. except that by the vine. Just keep on reading. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branch. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Keep reading. Keep reading. That's, that's good. So how many times do you hear the word abide right there? Probably, I don't know, ten? Let's say ten. Ten times Christ is talking about abiding in him and him abiding in you. His purpose was to be inside of you and you inside of him. But he had to be prepared for that. His whole birth was designed for us. Like Brother Hall wants to say, us's. His, his, his mama wasn't, you know, Queen Sheba. You know, she wasn't some fancy, high-ranking person. She's a 16-year-old ghetto girl from Palestine. His daddy wasn't an emperor. You know, he didn't sit around with the, at the Pantheon with the Athenians, you know, talking about philosophy. His daddy was a carpenter, make a minimum wage. Don't you see Jesus trying to relate to folk like me and you? They didn't have room for him at the end. Now, if they would have made room for him, then he could have said, yeah, Jesus Christ is born. What do you think that would have done for his business? It went through, through the roof. We'd probably still be going to that hotel today. In Bethlehem. It's still there. It's a real place. If you let make room for Jesus, there's no telling what there is telling. There's no limit to what he can do for you. But you have to do what? Make room. Now, what does it mean to make room? Some of us want to be lazy. But what does it mean to make room? Chris, you got a cell phone? Probably got about 300 girls' cell phone numbers in there, right? You can say it, man. Don't be ashamed. <laughs> but eventually you'll hit your limit on that cell phone, right? He said, I'll never hit him. <laughs> Maybe not. Khalil, where's Khalil? <laughs> there he is. You got toys, right? You got a toy chest? The kids have toy chests anymore? Not anymore? <laughs> I think. Y'all making me work this morning. <laughs> Khalil, imagine you had a toy chest. <laughs> That was about this big, and it was full of toys. You had to sit on it to close it, right? Now, this Christmas, you got how many toys? You don't know. Too many to count, right? So many. So many. Amen. I pray for you, Brother Al. <laughs> but to, I opened the door. There it is. If you got so many toys already, you got to sit down on the chest to close it. But now you got so many more toys, you don't have nowhere to put them, right? So, Cleo, what do you got to do if you want to put those toys in that chest? You can say it. You got to get rid of some of them, right? If you want to make, I'm glad he said it. The kids make it so easy. <laughs> if you want to make room for Jesus, you got to get rid of something. Oh, God. If you want Jesus to come into your heart, he said you have to invite him. Right. Now, you don't have to invite the devil. He'll just show up in your house. You know, before you know it, you'll be in the living room. He's sitting there on the TV with your remote control. You've got to kick him out. 
He, you, he, the devil ain't going to wait for an invitation. That's not how he works. You got to get in, you got to evict the devil and then get a restraining order. He still might have a key. But Jesus isn't like that. He's too much of a gentleman. You have to invite him into your heart. But you've got to make room for him in your heart. Before he can come in there, there's probably some things you've got to get rid of. The toy chest is full. You've got to get rid of them old beat up toys that don't work. The batteries are rusted inside of them. Because you want to make room for Jesus. Are y'all getting this? Are y'all thinking about y'all presence or y'all thinking about the sermon or what? <laughs> Merry Christmas. All right. We almost done, y'all. We almost done. Are we done? Do you have room for Jesus in your heart? If you make room, he'll come on in. Salvation can be yours. We're here this morning to celebrate his birth. Some of us forget that it was just a gift alone to open up your eyes this morning, to take that breath and be in your right mind to know that you were here this morning. That's a blessing. That's a gift. We take that for granted. We forget the things that he gives us Every single day. Not just on Christmas. It's good that the world has picked a day to celebrate the birth of the Savior of the world. That's a good thing. Any any time that you have an opportunity to talk about Christ and to celebrate Christ in his life, that's a good thing. I'll never tell anybody not to celebrate Christmas or to argue about the day that Christmas is. You're talking about Jesus Christ. You should be happy to talk. I wish they had 15 days and they couldn't figure out when it was. You know, we celebrated it all the time. As Christians, we do celebrate it all the time. Christmas was for us so that we could celebrate his birth, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Do you have room for Jesus? Do you make room for Jesus? When you go home this evening and you think about all the things that he's blessed you with this year, all the things that he's brought you through this year, and we'll talk about this next week for New Year's, but think about all the things he's given you. Have you ever been to a birthday party where the only person who wasn't getting presents was the person whose birthday it was? That's Christmas. How unselfish is that? You're celebrating Christ's birthday, and you're the one getting all the gifts. It had to be God, because ain't no, ain't no way in the world any of us would be doing that. you like, oh, you didn't bring a present? Well, see you later. I hope you ain't planning on getting no food. <laughs> Make room. I'm up here tripping again. Make room in your heart for Jesus. You had the opportunity today to do that. If you hear the gospel, you believe it with all your heart. You believe that he was born, he came here, he lived, he died, and he was raised again. You confess that. You say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You repent of your sins. You get rid of those things in your heart that you don't have room for anymore. You got to get rid of some of those things. Some of us want to wait because we feel like we're not ready. You know, some people don't come to church because they don't feel like they're clean enough. That's the whole reason that he was born the way he was born. He don't want you to be clean. If you were clean, you wouldn't need him. Because you are dirty, because you've got all those things that you need to get rid of, is why he was born. That's why he wants you in there. Because what does he want to do? He wants to wash you and make you clean. Don't worry about what your current life condition is. Don't worry about all the things that you've done in the past. He wants to wash you in his blood and make you as white as that snow outside there on the sidewalk. 
that I almost slipped in this morning. <laughs> I did slip yesterday. If you repent of, if repent of your sins, make room for them in your heart, the last thing for you to do is to be baptized in a watery grave of baptism. You go down dirty, feet and trough, nasty, and you come out clean and white as snow. Ain't God good? Amen. Amen. If you're subject to the invitation, we ask you to come as we together stand and sing. Ten free, tis for you.